Your Excellency Ambassador Chan Hung Chi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a Center for a New American Security Forum on Security in the Asia Pacific Region, a Singapore perspective, featuring the Minister of Defense of the Republic of Singapore, Dr. Ung Ng Hen. And good morning, I'm Patrick Cronin. I direct the Asia program at CNAS. And on behalf of our chairman, Richard Danzig, and our CEO, Nate Fick, I want to welcome all of you here today for this special program, which is made possible by the generous contribution of the Boeing Corporation. As the United States rebalances across the Indo-Pacific region, Southeast Asia is finally gaining attention from engaging China to peacefully re resolving disputes in the South China Sea and from expanding free trade to encouraging reform in Myanmar. Nothing is more important for the United States than the close strategic partnership we enjoy with Singapore. That is why the Center for a New American Security is so honored to host the Defense Minister on the occasion of his visit to Washington, D.C. to meet with Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Dr. Ng will speak on the record, followed by a non-attribution question and answer period. But first, it is my high honor to introduce a truly great American public servant, one who has served at least four presidents, Republican and Democrat alike, most recently as the fluent Mandarin-speaking ambassador to China, before that as a rock star two-term governor of Utah, and as a remarkable 32-year-old ambassador to Singapore, I remember it was my very first visit to Singapore. So without further ado, Governor John Huntsman. Thank you, Patrick, for that completely uh, undeserved introduction. Uh, in Chinese, they would simply say Ni Chang, the Dosha Fei Hua. It's all, <laughs> all air words for the most part. Uh, I'm, I'm honored and delighted uh, to be able to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Minister Ong. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to be in the presence of Ambassador Chan Heng Chi. Uh, when we look at the trajectory of the U.S. Singapore relationship, and again, I've been tied to it for at least 20 years. Uh, it really is based on certainly a commonality of interests, but also by personalities and people who have brought our nations together in ways that, one, speak to security cooperation, two, speak to commercial ties that I believe represent best practices, and number three, uh, the importance of people-to-people uh, -people engagement. And indeed, those have been the three pillars that have represented the U.S.-Singapore relationship so remarkably well uh, over the years. Uh, I must tell you, Minister, that uh, my last connection with your ministry was standing on the beach in Coronado, California, uh, right outside of the Naval Special Warfare Command headquarters, where I had a conversation with uh, the uh, gentleman who oversees uh, SEAL training. And I asked him about his BUDS class. And he said, oh, they're doing quite well. And as a matter of fact, we have uh, some overseas participants this time. And I said, well, tell me about that. He said, we have uh, actually uh, a Singaporean uh, who was part of our BUDS training. And I said, how is he performing? It's in my interest to keep an eye on Singaporeans as well from time to time. And he said, number one. <laughs> no one can keep up with it. So I like to think that uh, we are integrating ourselves in ways that uh, no one would have imagined uh, some years ago. And indeed, I go back 20 years ago to a transformation that was occurring shortly after we left the Philippines, Subic Bay and Clark Air Base, and we're looking to reposition ourselves in the region. Although it wasn't a popular thing to do in the region, then Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew believed that the American presence was indeed essential for the continuation of international law and order in the Asia-Pacific region. 
I used to get this lecture regularly when I would sit in with the senior minister. And the work that went into transitioning in the early days, Comlock Westpac from Manila into Singapore, and the work that then fell to us in the early 90s to finish out the Status of Forces Agreement, uh, and to build on that budding level of confidence uh, that was on display very, very early on. I remember it well uh, under Admiral Ron Tucker, who was the first uh, commander of Comlock Westpac. Just before that, he'd been the last uh, commanding officer of the USS uh, New Jersey. Phasing into Singapore, not an easy thing to do, not necessarily a popular thing to do, but flowing from an ideal, a view that rule of law and stability could not be guaranteed without a forward deployed U.S. presence. Now, just in building on that theme for a moment, Singapore has made a virtue out of pragmatism in its strategic relations. Recognizing that stability grows out of economic prosperity. Prosperity grows out of safe and open trade routes. Safe and open trade routes require a commitment to a rules-based system, along with a strong regional security overlay as insurance that provides confidence. Now, with two-thirds of our trade flowing across the Pacific, and more and more with each passing decade, this is a key area of convergence for both our countries. Number two, the United States is a Pacific power and will increasingly manifest itself in the Asia-Pacific region because our future will be in our ability to compete as a nation. Increasingly, we will recognize that our well-being here in the United States, our ability to expand our economic base and create jobs, is tied to whether or not we're willing to recognize economics and education, both of which are core to competitiveness. That will invariably take us more and more across the Pacific Ocean with our trading partners that seem to grow stronger with each passing year. Economics and security will only make our relationship more and more prominent in the years to come. But one of the reasons that I think the U.S.-Singapore relationship is so important uh, is that it has always represented more than just a run-of-the-mill relationship. To me, it has always represented an example of best practices. The world is always in search for where it can find best practices, whether it happens to be in free trade agreements or security relationships. And I remember well as U.S. Trade Ambassador, working with Ambassador John during the launch and finally wrapping up the free trade agreement between the United States and Singapore. We weren't negotiating just a free trade agreement. We were negotiating the gold standard for free trade agreements, realizing full well that the world would watch and look at and analyze the content of this relationship. Well, I believe that whether it's a free trade agreement or whether it's a, secure, a security uh, arrangement, the U.S.-Singapore relationship will always be noted for having on display for the world to see best practices. Dr. Ung is here uh, as Minister of Defense. Uh, he is a member of the Governing People's Action Party. He has served as a leader uh, of the House in Parliament from 2004 to 2008. He served as Minister for Manpower and from 2008 to 2011 served as Minister for Education. He has been an MP since 2001. Perhaps just as noteworthy and something near and dear to me as Chair of a Cancer Institute of the Western United States Previously, Dr. Ong maintained a private practice at Mount Elizabeth Medical Center as a surgical oncologist. He received his training at the National University of Singapore, the Royal College of Surgeons at Edinburgh, and MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. One personal note I will just mention in closing is that my son, William, now at the United States Naval Academy, 
was born at Mount Elizabeth Hospital right about the same time that Dr. Ung was there. Uh, is there a connection as it relates to Chinese speakers and an interest in security? Perhaps so. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Minister Ung. Thank you, Governor Hudson. Uh, really missing uh, finale to the story. I now wish that I personally delivered your son. <laughs> Before I begin, let me thank Governor Huntsman for his very kind words. And I was delighted when Ambassador Chan said that Governor Huntsman had agreed to uh, chair the session because, uh, as you know, he, he is an old friend of Singapore. On record, I think, as one of the youngest ambassadors, a uh, you know, reliable source that, uh, that when the documents went up, they thought it was a typo in the age. <laughs> the age 32 or 33. And he's, of course, a seasoned hand in the region. I want to thank the Center for New American Security for the opportunity to speak this morning with all of you together on the, it's Wednesday, right? <laughs> Wednesday morning to, to hear about uh, <coughs> peace and stability in the Asia Pacific region. I want to thank Dr. Cronin for hosting the discussion. I'm, as Governor Huntsman said, I'm here to meet all friends in Washington and also visit one of our Air Force fighter detachments. We have F 15 detachment in Mountain Dome in Idaho. Uh, we have actually four detachments here, two in Arizona one other one in Texas. And uh, this is a testament to very strong defense ties that we have. I'd like to begin the remarks, and I don't intend to take very long, because I look forward to uh, discussing with you this issue in terms of the US continuing role in maintaining peace and stability in the Asia Pacific. I'd like to begin by stating the assertion that the US presence in our region, the Asia Pacific region, has been a critical force for peace and stability for the past half a century. So when we say continuing role, we, we are specific in that this is the role that the US has played for half a century. This positive view of the U.S. influence in our region has been articulated by Singapore, a strategic partner of the U.S. But other leaders of us Asian countries who are not traditional allies also share this perspective. If I could just give two quotes. First from Malaysian Prime Minister Najib at last year's Shangri-La Dialogue. And he said, quote, the United States has long been a modernizing and moderating force within our region, supporting democratic institutions, improving governance, and fostering respect for human rights." Unquote. I'd like to share with you a second quote. This one comes from the former Indonesian Defense Minister, Dr. Juwono Sudasono. And he wrote in an article last year, quote, what is often understated is that Asia-Pacific cooperation, the birth of ASEAN in 1967, APEC in 1989, <coughs> East Asian Summit in 2006, were made possible by America's preeminence, America's forward presence, provided vital strategic assurance, guaranteeing regional and financial growth. Quote, unquote. The US as a resident power to use a phrase that former Secretary Gates said, the US as a resident power in the Asia Pacific region provided the stability that facilitated the rise of the four Asian tigers, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, as well as the spectacular rise of Japan's export-driven economy in the 1980s. China, too, has benefited from this order of the global commons international trading and finance systems. Governor Huntsman said how with the withdrawal of the US troops in Subic Bay, Singapore stepped forward. But it was for these reasons, believing that the US presence in the Asia Pacific was 
was a critical force for stability. And we facilitated US assets. They are not based in Singapore, but we have for many years provided transit and logistics support, I mentioned Comlock West Bank, for US military ships and aircraft in our region since the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding in the 1980s. In 2005, our Prime Minister and then President George Bush further signed a strategic framework agreement to facilitate the U.S. continued presence in the region and enhance bilateral cooperation in defense and security. And one manifestation of that increasing cooperation is the planned deployment of the U.S. Navy's littoral combat ships in Singapore. Singapore believes that the U.S. presence in the Asia-Pacific region remains vital to maintaining peace and stability in the region. In this context, we welcome the U.S. renewed commitment to engage Asia. Last year, the U.S. participated for the first time in the newly expanded East Asia Summit in Indonesia. In 2009, the U.S. announced the intention to participate in negotiations to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, an economic partnership for Asia-Pacific countries. But going forward, and that's a central question that I think preoccupies many of us, how can the United States, as a resident power, continue to play its positive role in the region and adjust to the rising aspirations of powerhouse economies like China and India, as well as ASEAN? Allow me to provide some texture to the changing, changing dynamics by way of some salient numbers. China currently is already the leading trade partner for ASEAN, Australia, Japan, and South Korea in the region. According to one estimate, China's economy will grow to US 16 trillion in 2030, quadruple its present size, economic size. The IMF projects that China could become the world's largest economy in PPP terms in 2016. India's economy is projected to grow to nearly six billion, US billion, six trillion in 2030, five times its current size. And by 2025, India is projected to overtake China as the most populous nation in the world. Against the backdrop of shifting balances, the US China relationship is the critical relationship that will affect peace and stability in the Asia Pacific region. How will this relationship, the US-China relationship, be characterized moving forward, especially with regard to military relations? On intent, there has been no shortage of goodwill statements from both the US and China. Following President Hu Jintao's state visit to the US last year, the joint statement read, and I quote, the United States and China affirm that a healthy, stable, and reliable military-to-military -military relationship it's an essential part of President Obama's and President Wu's shared vision for a positive, cooperative, and comprehensive U.S.-China relationship. Both sides agreed on the need for enhanced and substantive dialogue and communication at all levels to reduce misunderstanding, misperception, and miscalculation, to foster greater understanding and expand mutual interests, and to promote the healthy, stable, and reliable development military to military relationship, unquote. But in practice, much more work is needed to achieve this, quote, stable, healthy, stable, and reliable military to military relationship <coughs> between the US and China. The recent announcement of its pivot to Asia was read by some in China as a strategy for containment. Even the Trans-Pacific Partnership was cast by some in the late, same light. The U.S. on its part has repeatedly asked China to be more transparent in strategic intent, particularly with regard to its military buildup. In maintaining peace and stability for the Asia-Pacific region, we need to also consider the bilateral relationships between U.S., China, and ASEAN countries, as well as other stakeholders in the Asia-Pacific region, like Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. We recognize that there will be elements of competition, even strategic rivalry, in these relationships. But despite this, we must create opportunities to build common understanding and cooperation among the defense establishments of these countries. 
I've posed some questions. I'd like to share ASEAN's view, Singapore's view of how we think we can foster that common understanding and confidence building. To maintain stability, we must evolve a regional architecture for the Asia Pacific region that brings together all key stakeholders in the region and accommodates their interests and aspirations. ASEAN has therefore proposed and put considerable efforts into fostering such a regional architecture that brings together all key stakeholders in the region, including the US, China, India, and Russia, for dialogue and cooperation. ASEAN is a key stakeholder in the region. The 600 million people and a combined GDP of US 3.1 trillion. Most ASEAN neighbor states border the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca and Singapore key sea lanes for global trade and commerce. By way of comparison, for example, in 2010, China accounted for US 91 billion of US exports. ASEAN, with less than half China's population, accounted for about US 70 billion. ASEAN's strategic population importance has been acknowledged by US leaders. President Obama, Defense Secretaries and Secretary Hillary Clinton have made frequent visits to our part of the world. The U.S. has also played a pivotal role in supporting the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, or ADMM Plus. Let me elaborate a little on the ADMM Plus. The ADMM Plus is a forum that brings together defense establishments of all 10 ASEAN member states and 8 plus countries, U.S., China, Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Russia. The ADMM Plus framework acts as a key anchor of a robust, effective, open and inclusive regional security architecture to address common security challenges and promote stability in the region. The inaugural ADMM Plus in 2010 agreed to go beyond dialogue to provide platforms for practical cooperation among the 18 ADMM Plus militaries. To enhance military-to-military -military interactions, five expert working groups were established for a start in these areas. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, maritime security, peacekeeping operations, counterterrorism, and military medicine. Through these expert working groups, militaries of ADMM Plus members are working together on joint exercises to build confidence and mutual understanding. The U.S. participation in this regional security architecture of ADMM Plus is indispensable. The U.S. was the first of eight plus countries to accept the invitation to join the ADMM Plus two years ago. The US currently co-chairs with Indonesia the ADMM Plus Expert Working Group on Counterterrorism and is in fact meeting in both Indonesia and US are meeting in Washington over the next few days to hold a workshop and plan for an exercise. Such a move towards the ADMM Plus militaries exercising together is a significant one. Militaries working together can enhance transparency, comfort levels, build trust and confidence, and reduce the risk of miscalculation and conflict. Platforms like the ADM Plus and the annual Shangri-La Dialogue are also essential to allow defense leaders of countries to exchange views and perspectives. Then Secretary Gates, the Chinese Defense Minister, General Yang Kong-Lie, as well as other non-ASEAN defense ministers, met ASEAN defense ministers for a good exchange of views in inaugural ADM Plus in Vietnam. The next ADMM Plus will be in 2013. <coughs> Let me conclude. As the balance of the world's strategic and economic weight shifts towards the Pacific, it is vital to evolve a regional security architecture which accommodates all stakeholders and rising aspirations. Relationships marked predominantly by strategic rivalry will increase the risk of friction and conflict. We must therefore engage in ways to increase understanding and confidence among defense establishments. The U.S. as a resident power should continue to play its dominant role in maintaining peace and stability in the Asia Pacific. It can do so effectively within the regional, arcs, regional security architecture to improve relationships at bilateral and multilateral levels. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your attention. Look forward to hear your insights and continue this conversation on how we can maintain peace and stability in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much.